Hey gang, what's good? Welcome back to Pillars of Eternity 2 Deadfire. We are here at Harbinger's Watch at the very beginning of the Beast of Winter DLC. Yeah. Where sure. we have just killed the messenger. It was quite difficult. And like I said in between videos, I did go and look up if we were supposed to die. I know you're not. It's just a very difficult fight. A lot of people echoing those thoughts that yes, it is in fact incredibly difficult. <laughs> Getting, uh, we, we did for the most part actually figure out a lot of the mechanics. I didn't see anyone mention about using this to avoid one of the, the like suck in attack, but definitely people saying that being able to get rid of Lengrath's safeguard was a big deal and that it really sucked if you didn't have party members who had, um, either just, just party members with resources that didn't get expended, right? Tell me. So, Chanter, Cypher, or Tell Monk, me, uh, right? Because the fight would go on for just ever. And if you couldn't kill him within a certain amount of time, you would just be screwed, right? Even with Empower. All right, let's do a quick save again and head on up here. See what everybody's fucking doing. They don't seem to enjoy the fact that we killed uh, the messenger. You've ruined everything. Can, can the end be ended? <laughs> All right. Let's see. Harbinger Halfjorn. Oh, yeah, look at all this stuff from when everyone got blown up. Is he dead? Can death die? Hmm. All right. Let's see. What have we got here? A bunch of clothes, baby pearls. I'll take them. Did the vendors back over here also get blown up? I can't remember. Let's see. What do you have? The to truth say? has been revealed. Even endings end, and you, you have brought that to us. Thank you, Dusk Speaker. Oh. Pinching the bridge of her nose, Edwin sighs. <laughs> that was hardly the first time I've dealt with a dragon. Proves nothing. Finally, recognition my troublemaking deserves. Yes, I am the destroyer, the very hungry destroyer. Feed me fish. I'm only here for the fish. Uh, let's go with this. Finally, the recognition my troublemaking deserves. See anything that interests? <laughs> Aloth did not like that. Because <laughs> we are irresponsible. All right. Take you have anything new? Let's see. So maybe, I don't know if it's just her or if they will all... Oh. Aloth's fingers fidget with the hem of his outfit, and his mouth is pressed into a thin frown. He gives you a familiar, uncertain look as if he's trying to figure out what to say. What is it? You seem try- Oh no, it's because we lost some reputation with him for being irresponsible. What is it? You seem troubled. Care to discuss it? Keep it up and you'll your face will stay that way. Whatever this is, I don't want to hear it. Let's see. You seem troubled. He relaxes a little. Earlier, I told you how confident I felt in your sense of direction. How you've borne your burdens. He purses his lips around the inevitable, but... But lately, you don't seem to recognize the gravity of the situation before you. That troubles me. What do you mean? Speak plainly. You have my full attention, Aloth. Whatever this is, I don't want to hear it. What do you mean? I know you have a troubled past. You've oh. learned to look out for yourself, and you're accustomed to going where the wind takes you. Oh, wow, that's cool. I wonder if he would have said something else if we weren't a drifter. Nevertheless... Chasing Aethys and treating with the leaders of Deadfire has put you in a position of incredible responsibility. Are you about to give me a Spider-Man talk? I know you care deeply about a great many things. You're certainly not shy about expressing it. A tired smile peers and vanishes just as quickly. I only wish you took your role more seriously. It so often seems you're oblivious to the lives that depend on you, or unconcerned by them. His expression darkens. What are you asking of me? You've misunderstood me. I appreciate your candor, Aloth. Don't lecture me. Ever. Hmm. Let's see. I either want to say you've misunderstood me or I appreciate your candor. No, I appreciate your candor. I must admit, after receiving so much advice from you, it feels strange to be on the other end of things. He cocks his head thoughtfully. We both know the choices before us aren't always clear or simple. I only ask that you give them due attention. All right, Aloth, I'll do my best. No more than any of us can do. 
Well, thank you for hearing me out. This is a great weight off my chest. Nekataka may be divided, but its people look to you. Pelagina nods, the corners of her mouth turning to a faint I can only group. hope you keep that in mind. Shit, what is our current rep with Aloth? Let's see. Reputations. Check myself. Ooh, we are at negative one with Aloth. He is our only party member who is low. Oh shit, everyone else is... Well, Jody's kind of low, but that's because we haven't played with her that often. Alright. Let's see. How can we get good points? Autonomy and dutiful. Shit, but he hates pride and irresponsibility. He also hates traditionalism, but I'm not very traditional. But I am quite irresponsible and usually pretty prideful. <laughs> Alright. Uh. He won't leave the party, will he? Maybe. Fuck, I don't know. Alright. Let's see here. We'll give him some rest. He's He's got a gaping wound. Oh, God. No wonder he's upset. Alright. Head on in here. Speak with Vatnir. He'll probably say... Oh, shit, you killed the dragon? Well, you better go up this giant mountain and go see more of them. <laughs> or something. I do like the that interesting twist of word that, can you end uh, the end? At once. Hmm. All right, Harbinger Valbrentior. What are you Hello episode? again. The man bows slightly at the waist. Have you seen Vatnir? He's not in the chapel. He didn't follow the others outside, so perhaps try his quarters. They're just down the hall. Uh-oh. I stole from him. I'd like to rent a room. The accommodations are most modest, but as comfortable as a kith could hope. All right. Yeah, we need this bed. Aloth needs it at least. There we are. Man, honestly, if anything, I'm impressed that we did it with... Hmm. Edwin being so vastly underleveled for that. Because they were scaled for the Watcher, right? The the Messenger was scaled to, like, two levels higher than we were. So it would have been 21, right, if we're level 19. And Edwin is level 14. Holy shit. Yes. All right. A sure thing. Let's do a quick save here. But I, I feel pretty confident about that. We still had a lot more options we could have taken. Like I said... We could have swapped out for Maya or given just armor to our casters if we really needed to. Let's see. Yeah, hey, not up here. Hey, where's that horny guy? <laughs> oh, at least we know we can't lose him in the crowd. <laughs> Fuck, I want a clip of that, of Matt Mercer asking, hey, where's that horny guy? <laughs> here he is, Adair, you found him. You're looking at him. <laughs> All right. Let's do a quick save. You don't think he noticed. Maybe he noticed that we took the item. Oh shit, he's looking for it. Oh, he's looking for it! Vatnir. Vatnir cowers. Hands atop his bandaged head. Fingers interlinked defensively. He doesn't react at all to your presence. On your feet, coward. It's okay, Vatnir. It's over. This is not what I imagined embracing Oblivion to look like. Your people are dying and you're in here hiding? Clear your throat. Oh. He's a Rimmergon godlike and he just kind of went with it. Right? He probably doesn't fully buy into it or believe the ideas. I see. All right. This is not what I imagined embracing Oblivion to look like. Trembling alone in a dark corner of a hidden room is just how we glam felons show affection. Mm. Vatnir cringes at the sound, then slowly turns his head to peer up at you. Though his mask remains impassive and cold, his twitching fingers and rounded shoulders bespeak abject terror. I'm not hiding. I just... I had to sacrifice something that I was saving for the messenger, and I, I couldn't find it, so I was looking for it. Very convincing. The stammering really sells it. What kind of sacrifice? When I killed your messenger, Rimmergon didn't say a word in complaint, and the gods are not shy around me. The beast is dead. He can come out now. 
Let's say this. Yeah, when I killed your messenger, Rimmergun didn't say anything. You... you killed it? That's... that's good. That it's dead. It's been harrying the watch now, well, for years. But people keep coming, and it keeps eating. Right. Each time it comes, the ice spreads further. I... I didn't know how to end it. So I wrote to you. Certainly telling your followers that it was a manifestation of the divine come to usher them unto oblivion didn't confuse matters. Why did... why write to me? How did an unbeliever like you ending end up leading this community? What can you tell me about this that creature? Do you know why this iceberg exists? We're a long way from the white that wins. Hmm. Let's see. How did an unbeliever like you end up leading this community? Or maybe we can just ask all of these. Yeah, why write to me? Because you're the Dusk Speaker. <laughs> he chuckles, though the sound dissolves into a series of thick, wet coughs. Chuckle politely. So you keep saying. So there's no threat of the dead flow expanding. Just answer the question. Say nothing. Just answer it. Sorry, sorry. He shrinks from you. You have a reputation, don't you? Uh, you overcome things. You triumph. Except for the times I don't. You're coming to the <laughs> dead fire. It seemed too great an opportunity to ignore. Okay. Huh. How did an unbeliever like you end up leading this community? It's not that... I'm not an... His head falls with a long sigh. Yeah, he's totally conning them or something. I... We're rare... The god touched. Yeah. More so, those changed by the beast of winter. Yeah, that's what I was thinking, huh? Can you not create a beast of winter godlike or whatever? Growing to adulthood in the land, in the white that wends, it's difficult enough without the numbness, the stiffness, the pain. Hmm. Similar to how I don't think you can create a Helian godlike like Palagina is. Those of us who... To survive, our communities expect things of us. Leadership. Wisdom. So you just donned the role presented you. Like a well-cut coat. I became the leader they expected me to be. Right, yeah. How did you end up here, on this iceberg? Our elders told stories about this place. The Veedmouth, the White Moor, and about the... Endless void beyond. Veedmouth. Oh, okay. White Maw. What is White Maw? I guess just this general island, right? A few years ago, a man named Glasval led his clan to the frost hewn breach in Eir Glanfath, seeking a path from this world to the realm of Remergant. They never returned. Sounds familiar. Yo, is that what I was. Oh shit, is that the dude from Twin Elms? Sounds familiar. Vatnir inhales through his teeth, quick and gurgled. The tale passed from mouth to ear to mouth again, and people began to think, if Glasval could escape, why can't we? I suppose I saw in that an opportunity, a chance to leave the land behind. So I claimed I had a vision, and the beast was calling me. The lie was more successful than I could have imagined. And I can imagine quite a lot. Though not, apparently, how to leave the land by chartering passage on a boat like the rest of us. With what coin? I had none. What of you? How did you afford the fare? This isn't about Yedwin. That's a good question. How did you pay passage to the Republics? Say nothing. Yeah, let's get more lore on Edwin. Edwin's eyes widen behind her spectacles and fall away. I took what I required from a dead man. More than that, I will not say. Not here. Not now. Now you take what you require from the living. And you treat me as a hypocrite. <laughs> he snorts. What can you tell me about that creature? I don't know what to tell you. It's a dragon. Or looks like one. And rotten enough that linking it to the God of Decay seemed reasonable. Huh. This place is holy to him, so perhaps I'm not wrong. Alright, yeah. Do you know why this iceberg exists? 
We're a long way from the white that wins. No. Whatever answers you seek, you will likely find within the temple. The temple beneath the ice. There's a temple under the ice. What's it doing inside of an iceberg? I don't know. I think maybe the iceberg formed around the temple. Huh. And it sank it? Perhaps it's because of the Veet Mouth. The closer you get to it, the colder everything becomes. Okay. All right, yeah, so Veet Mouth isn't... White Maw isn't the name of this iceberg. What exactly is this Veet Mouth? Like the frost Breach, it's a passage through the walls of the world. From this one to the next. That doesn't sound safe. To the White Void, specifically. Seat of Reamer Gunt himself. Oh, right, yeah, that is what they wanted to do in Twin Elms, wasn't it? I think so. You... Whoa. <laughs> what was that? It sounded like some strange cat. That was from the game as well. well. This is like the second time some, like, strange ambient audio played. <laughs> Have we never heard that before? That just sounded like a cat. All right. You know this for certain. I'm going to go take a look at this portal, and you're coming with me. Just tell me how to get to this maw. You know this for certain? So the stories say. None who has gone in has ever returned to confirm it. But you wouldn't expect them to, right? Hmm. Huh. And you're coming- that seems, like, threatening. Let's see, just tell me how to get to this maw. You'll need to climb the cliff overlooking Harpinger's Watch. That's the only way we know to enter. Here, these should help. He pulls a pair of ice picks from the detritus behind him and passes them to you with shaking hands. Thank you. Kill him. And this is for the dead. You're coming along to show me the way. Kill him wordlessly. Walk away. Wow. Jesus. I mean, I guess in a way he did get these people killed. Right? Hmm. Hmm. Fuck, it's a little intense, though, to just kill him. Right? Alright, thank you. He nods numbly. Vatnir's ice picks. This item was put into your stash. Oh. The messenger has spoke! Dusk speaker? What? Why are you... What is this room? Well, you see, uh, I was... Um, we... We're just discussing some matters of orthodoxy. The godlike's three tightly clumped eyes swivel towards you nervously. Your priest here is a faithless coward who hid when the dragon came. Yes, we were deep in discourse. Very deep. Intellect check of ten. <laughs> Fuck, we're dumb. You dare question the dusk speaker? Say nothing. Eh, you dare question the dust Speaker? Oh, look, I say dust. <laughs> Dusk speaker. Dusk speaker? What? No, of course not. I just, well, apologies. And, uh, never mind. Half your cringes. What? Uh, Rimmergan's messenger has fallen. What should we do now? Survive and keep our work going. The Dusk speaker and I will set everything aright. I swear it. Hafjorn nods, his shoulders falling slightly as he visibly relaxes. I should probably get back to the surface to do surface things. Huh. Okay. And you don't think, is Vatnir like a companion? Is that actually what that was about? Is Vatnir the companion? Hang You're, on. You've returned. Yeah. I think he's a fucking companion. He clears his throat. Remind me how I get to the temple? I should be going. First, remind me how I get there. Why not? Oh, game's hitching a bit. There we go. Remind me how I get to the temple. On the northern edge of the watch, an ice wall rises. You'll need to, uh, ascend it carefully, then down the far side. All right, great. Well, grab your things. You're coming with me. I... wait, what? I can't! I've got responsibilities! Vatnir fidgets. Then stay here. You need to set this right, Vatnir. Help me help your people. We can do a streetwise check or a religion slash metaphysics check. Ooh, we almost passed that streetwise check. Hmm. Let's see. 
How about we say... Now, you need to set this right. I... Uh, I suppose I owe it to them. He stares into his bandaged palms. Fine! Fine! I'll... I'll accompany you to the Veet Mouth. Gods protect us. Arms tight around his torso, he cradles himself. Thank you, Vodnir. You made the right choice. Let's go. You made the right choice. He nods numbly. Oh, shit. Wow, he's got a lot of eyes. Okay. Let's see. Who do we want? Subclass Rimmergon Priest. So he's a priest no matter what, but he can be a priest chanter or a priest rogue. I'm thinking we go priest chanter, right? Chanters are just so good. Maybe we could have him replace Palagina or something like that? Yeah. Let's see. What kind of shit do you do? What is your Rimmergon priest thing all about? Oh, hitching a bit. There we go. Okay. God of Entropy, Cold, Winter, Bad Luck, Famine, and Natural Disasters. Manifests as a giant alb- Okay, yeah, that's just Rimmergon. Priests of Rimmergon automatically learn the following spells at the appropriate power level. Okay, Touch of Rot, a Decay spell. Damage. Okay. Blizzard. Also damage. Spreading Plague. Debuff. Okay. Noxious Blast. Debuff and damage. Blast of Frost. Frost damage. Freezing Pillar. Also damage. And some Hobble, I guess. Death Ring. Okay. Symbol of Rimmergond. Frightened. Okay. And down here, Call of Rimmergond. Minus five seconds, all beneficial effects. Which we won't be having access to. If we did go that route. Of having him multi-class. Because I'm thinking if we have him multi-class, we should spec him... For heals, right? Hmm. I don't know. Because there's not really much in the form of crowd control. Yeah, we would have to spec him for heals and be like an alternative healer. Maybe we do that. And we just straight up ignore most of his... His DPS abilities that he gets from being a Rimmergond priest. Right? I think we that's the route we go. Okay. Huh. Is... Is Rimmergon's situation like battle axes then? Dual wield battle axes? You know how a or I'm not sure. Gone. They use sickles and lanterns. Hatchets even. Okay. Yeah, I think that's what we do with them. We spec them for heals. Okay. Sure. Priest enchanter. There we are. Who do we... Fuck, yeah, we, we need to get rid of Palagina, don't we? Uh, we have to get rid of someone. I don't like the idea of getting rid of her, because she's probably our MVP. Right? Worst case, we can just swap them back out, right? Yeah. Okay. We'll go that route. Shit, we need to pull stuff off of her, though, I think. Okay, fortunately I'm there's a lot of equipment and party management stuff we can take care of right here. Okay, we could dump the scepter. Which I think maybe we ought to do, right? Yeah. Could move the scepter off of Palagina, because she doesn't really use it. She's so tanky now. She can survive in melee. Just fine. Alright. We could even just give her, like, a generic ranged weapon if we wanted. Like one of these pistols or something. Hmm. Do we have another... Whale of a Wand? We could also give that to our friend. Let's see. Hmm. Oh yeah, priests can use this. 
Maybe we give this to him. Maybe he would be good in melee. Right? Maybe. All right. Yeah, we do have options. Okay. We'll give the scepter back to Palagina. Okay, good. Huh? As you Let's wish. see. We'll talk to this dude over here and swap our party out a bit. Okay. Let's see. Where is he at? Over down here? Yeah, I think... Yeah, okay. Hello again. Hey, I need supplies. What I have is yours. Let's see. You got anything new after all that? No, you do not. Fair enough. Party management. Goddess. And let's get Vatnir. Because we, we should have him with us, right, for this DLC. Because he'll be relevant here. Okay. Good. Like I said, worst case scenario, we switch let's back out. Or even worse, worst case, right? Uh, another backup plan I had for that fight was we create custom hmm? party members. Because we've got the money we could spend on that if we wanted to. All right. Though ideally I would like to do all of it with uh, relevant party members who are relevant to the story and will have like extra dialogue and oh no fucking way of course it didn't despawn ooh yo that doesn't look good no that's not right when we kill dragons are supposed to stay dead pretty sure there's a law about it <laughs> good lord all right, yeah, that makes a lot of sense. That's why it looks so fucked up. Huh. Man, somebody needs to ring up the fucking Dragonborn, I guess. <laughs> All right. Do you have anything to say about that? That was pretty weird, huh? Hello again, Dusk Speaker. See anything that interests? No, not really. Go down here. Let's see. Another harbinger. Your return! Is it too much to hope that you do so bearing fluid from a rhyme construct? No, sorry. Okay, no one has anything to say about how that thing just flew off? Let's see, maybe Halfjorn does. It means so much to us that you're here. Oh, okay. Let's look down here. That makes sense, and we didn't really get any loot off of it either, did we? Hmm. All right. And... Sure, I guess our only other option is to ascend up there. Let's see. What do you have by default on you? Oh, you have... High Harbinger Robes. Ooh. Okay, nothing survives. Though similar to the other Harbinger's Robes, these furs bear one pungent difference. The putrid stench that hangs about them like an aura. This makes it nearly impossible for anyone besides Vatnir to wear them. Unless they lack faculties of taste and smell. Huh. Weird. So can no one else actually legit wear them? Oh, God! Yo, he's a zombie! Oh, my God! That makes a lot of sense. I wasn't expecting it, but that makes a lot of sense. Jesus. So is this why he's got the... Why would he have three eyes, though? <laughs> All right. Does Rimorgand have a lot of eyes, like a spider or something? Let's see. Will Yidwin wear it? Hey, she will. Look. She loves it. All right. But we're keeping it on him. That makes more sense. All right. What all does it do? Action speed increases as health decreases. Max of 20%. It is superb by default. Plus 5% damage, but 5% damage taken. Accelerated Decay. Which just doubles everything. Slow Grind. 35% chance to deal 5 corrode damage per 3 seconds for 9 seconds when hit with weapons. Weird. Okay. Huh. Fair enough. Let's see, in his weapons and all that, superb. Okay. Starting him out with some pretty decent stuff. Okay. Cool. Well, I suppose in between videos, I guess we'll make this one short. Huh? I mean, after all, we went long That's in the last wish. one. That's my excuse. 
but I'll spec him out and all that stuff and get equipment on him. I may have to pull equipment off of our other party members because we may want to have him pretty well geared for this. I don't know. What level is he? Let's see. Or what level can he go up to? I'm assuming he scales with the Watcher, right? We'll see about that. All right. Yeah, but for now, if you'd like to stick around, we will, of course, be doing some reading. Let's see. How about this calendar situation? Calendar. Yeah, we've read that. Fair enough. Let's see. Yeah, I think we've read everything. Should we read some of the bestiary or bestiary? There we are. Let's see. What should we read about? How about... Was that fucking dragon on there? What would it be? A primordial? Hmm. No. There's dragon. Hmm. Yeah, nothing. Alright, we'll just work our way down. Okay, bats. <laughs> you want to learn about bats? Yeah, there's quite... I, honestly, there's a fucking lot here about bats. Weird. Okay. Yeah. Huh. Maybe we'll get lore about other things as well. Okay. <laughs> lore about bats. Significantly larger than their more diminutive brethren, brethren, the Deadfire's giant bats have traded in docile herbivorous diet in a docile... Herb herbivorous diet, diet, Jesus Christ, for a strictly carnivorous one. They are aggressive and clever, making them a scourge of local populations. While they rarely attack towns and villages, they won't hesitate to descend upon the lone traveler outside of settled areas. In recent years, there have been scattered reports by colonial settlers of giant bats unlatching windows, and in one bizarre incident, an armory door. Wow. Giant bats are, as their name implies, quite large. Though their wingspans are remarkable, nearly six feet from thumb to thumb, the weight of their long muscular bodies curtails their ability to fly between islands. Ah. Consequently, giant bats are highly specialized to their home island environments, resulting in a truly remarkable variety of bat types. The way giant bats hunt is somewhat unusual. They do not echo-locate, but instead crash into their intended prey, hoping to knock the prey to the ground where it can be more easily subdued. Compounding their threat, giant bats are also a natural disease reservoir, capable of transmitting several fatal illnesses like jungle rot and the pox through their saliva. Due to their long association with giant bats, the Hawana are largely immune to this manner of disease transmission. Colonists, unfortunately, are not. Bear. Bears are widely... Oh, oh okay, yeah, we do have a picture. I think that's a Pillars 1 picture as well. Right? From the Pillars 1 bestiary. Bears are widely distributed across the Deadfire Archipelago. They favor dens dug into hillsides where their preferred foods, murkberries, yellowa nuts, and ants are plentiful. Ugh, eating ants. Uh, slightly smaller than their eastern reach cousins, deadfire bears are nonetheless vicious opponents when goaded to violence. In the early years of deadfire colonization, colonists were occasionally killed in bear attacks. The Tikawara bear incident is particularly infamous. Seven colonists died in the first attack, then three more following the night when the bear returned during a funeral vigil. On occasion, deadfire bears have been known to fall prey to tigers, adult females and their cubs being especially vulnerable. This is attributed in part to their inability to climb trees, unlike their counterparts across the sea. Oh, huh. Okay. Beetles. Anything different about all of these? Nope. All beetles have the same lore. Alright. Beetles are not quite folk-sized, but they still strike a sufficiently intimidating form to frighten off most travelers. The largely uninhabited sways, swaths of the Deadfire Archipelago give beetles plenty of room to multiply. The most successful species of large beetle have evolved to not only camouflage themselves in the surrounding environment, 
but also to grow carapaces made out of common and hardy materials, such as wood, stone, and Audra. I think I remember fighting Audra beetles. Despite all appearances to the contrary, there is an underlying complexity to the common beetle. When they choose a material with which to develop their shell, they do so with a level of intention that borders on artistry. Wood beetles will often bore intricate holes in their carapaces. By blowing air through these makeshift pipes, they play an eerie music to attract mates. Stone beetles fashion rudimentary tusks and horns that help them to defend themselves to attack and to attack prey. The intricacies of Audra beetles are as of yet not well understood, save that they are notoriously difficult to kill. I wonder if they can like host souls inside of their shell or whatever. Alright. Boar. We'll read all the way down to Kraken, I think. Right? Why not? Let's see, are all of these different? Yes, they are. Wild boars are considered a nuisance and danger in the areas where most colonies settle, colonists settle. Aggressive and fearless, boars have killed many human and elven children, as well as fully grown orlans. Packs of boars can be a threat to any traveler or explorer. They are notoriously difficult to put down, but their tusks are valued by traders and enchanters. Wild boars are deemed pests by most communities, as wherever they are introduced, they are likely to outcompete the local fauna. Their uncanny adaptability has made them difficult to eradicate. Dog. Ooh, a war dog. <laughs> Look at him go! Dogs have been selectively bred over thousands of years to distill their beneficial behaviors, abilities, and attributes into the animal that exists today. In addition to being kept as able, dedicated companions, they are also used by kith to aid in hunting, herding, and protection. They are ubiquitous across the cultures of Aora. Stories abound of dogs so loyal they will stay with their masters even after death, eventually expiring themselves. Local legend in the Deadfire Archipelago tells of dog, of a dog called Pusuki, whose dedication to his master is said to have been such that he still guards his master's corpse to this day, 115 years after his death. Jesus. All right. Oh, we have some different stuff here for these. Okay. Drakes and young dragons, like worms. Okay. Young dragons begin their life cycle as worms, though most never develop beyond that stage. Worms are clever and sly, but not especially intelligent. To develop into a drake and eventually a dragon, a worm must have ample space and resources. They will not develop if they live near existing drakes and dragons. They must seek out a habitat that has not already been claimed by a larger counterpart. Since the chances of further development are low, most worms will band together in covens for survival. Yet, they remain bold and highly aggressive creatures, so the covens they form tend not to last long. Drake Drakes represent the middle stage of a dragon's life cycle. They have developed from worms, but not yet reached, and may never reach, the dragon stage. Drakes will aggressively defend their territory and seek to expand it as much as possible. Drakes are actively hostile toward other drakes, against other drakes, as they represent competition for scarce, scarce resources. Their coloration reflects the territory they have claimed. A drake living in a swamp, for instance, may be shades of green, brown, and black, and possess uh, nictitating membranes, a flat snout, and raised nostrils. While all drakes can breathe fire, many also develop alternate breath attacks, incorporating other elements, like the stinky burp drake. <laughs> I'm sorry. <laughs> all right. Grubs... Regular grubs and grublings, right? The shy halud. A giant one. Okay. Sand grub. 
Oh man, look, there's a lot of stuff on grubs. All right. Cave grub. Regular grubs, I think. Grubs are burrowers and scavengers, capable of subsisting on little more than the moisture leached from rocks for their entire lifespans. Hunting larger prey only serves the most basic need of storing energy for the expenditure it takes to carve out vast networks of tunnels and colonies for nesting. However, imposing these creatures leave most of the backbreaking labor of expanding the colony to grublings. Many gr mature grubs tend to retire from outward expansion, instead taking on the task of maintaining and protecting the heart of a colony and the grounds reserved for breeding. Their corrosive saliva is used as a tool of construction and predation, numbering cave grubs among Aeora's most efficient and adaptable hunters. Sorry, excuse me. All right, I am back. Sorry about that. Got a drink and blew my nose a bit. Let's see. Grublings, yeah. Cave grublings represent their species' developmental midpoint and the status they will hold for much of their life. The hardest workers, and therefore the most voracious eaters, cave grublings are not above devouring each other, or submitting to be devoured. Wow. To serve a colony in need. The latter stage of their life cycle is typically reserved for breeding and defense. Comforts and honors reserved for only those strong enough to endure this challenging and frenetic phase of growth. Giant cave grub. Rarely sighted and even more rarely survived, this cave grub of monumental size requires a significant amount of resources and space to survive. Aque aqueous sacs in the cranial cavity allow this enlarged animal to emit a biosonar lore? that can attract other cave grubs to its precise location. Yo! What the fuck? I mean, I guess that explains why we got all those ads in that fight. Alright. Sand grub. Yeah, same stuff. Okay. Typically observed in arid climes, sand grubs are well adapted to the harshest of environments. Their thick, rock-hard carapaces provide protection and specialized tissues between their scales collect and store humidity, limiting water loss. Though adapted to survive long periods without water, sand grubs will frequently build their nests in close proximity to streams, ponds, and oases where prey is plentiful. Sandworms are ambush hunters, prepared to wait extended periods of time beneath the sands for a hapless meal to wander by. Their diet is limited only by their size. Given a robust supply of prey, sandworms can grow to be truly formidable. And finally, Kraken. Huh, I think that's new art for the Kraken. Not the same one that was used in the first game? I'm not sure, I could be mistaken. Sailors across Aeora tell stories of the beasts that haunt the deep. Of these, few are more feared than the Kraken. Krakens rarely venture to the surface, and they almost never leave survivors in their wake. They are massive, tentacled beasts, capable of crushing small ships and plucking sailors from their decks. Despite their size, Kraken's soft, flexible bodies allow them to squeeze through tight spaces in search of prey or shelter. Thankfully, they prefer dark, quiet spaces to open water. They are cunning hunters and, according to legend, Andra's terrible servants. Ah. Okay. Huh. Too bad we can't update it with some of our extra learned knowledge and all that, right? Fair enough. Alright, yeah, we've got a lot of reading that we can do in the bestiary. So far it seems pretty interesting, right? Some of the stuff seemed very, very worthwhile. Other stuff seemed more, I don't know, plain. I don't know, even, even the bear one was a little interesting, like, for whatever reason, dead fire bears cannot climb trees. Huh? Yeah. Yeah, every single one of them has a little bit of something interesting, doesn't it? Okay, yeah, I think we'll keep reading through this. Alright, yeah, sorry, a bit of a short one, but it makes sense to me to call it a question, and watcher? level up and go through all of his equipment and stuff in between videos. And then when next we come back, we'll go up here. Right? That seems like a good plan. 
Until next time, please take care of each other.